I love collecting. When I was a kid, I used to collect baseball cards and football cards and basketball cards. And it's not just an extractive environment. It's like people do it because they love it. And they get value. They have intrinsic emotional value about the thing they're collecting. It's not just about flipping it. And like, that's what's so great about collecting. What's been so hard about brands being able to sort of do anything with this is that they had to manufacture physical goods or give discounts. And those two things are still important, but they're they're expensive. The ability to create an actual digital asset that can be coveted for emotional reasons, but also has utility like a coupon or like an access pass or a membership pass, that's an amazing combination. I think that's why Forum 3 is, you know, you know, trying to set the world on fire when it comes to this topic. <laughs> Hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. Guys, I am so, so stoked for this episode. You have heard me talk about my guests today and what they are building many times in this podcast. I feel like they are the talk of the town in Web3. As a little preamble, I will say this, a fact that I have uh, shouted out on this podcast ever since I heard it, which is that the Starbucks app is the second most used payment app in the country, in the United States, second only to Apple Pay. That is wild. And of course, you know where I'm going here. I am joined today by the co-founding team of Forum3, which is the NFT blockchain loyalty business that is building out the Starbucks Odyssey loyalty program. We are going to dive all into what they are working on, both with Starbucks. We'll probably get into some of the other projects they're working on. But I am stoked, stoked, stoked about this conversation and about this project. Welcome to the show. We've got Adam Brotman, Andy Sack, and Joe O'Rourke. Hello, y'all. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so yeah. we are going to get into all of, all of the good stuff here. I, I want to even take a step back and talk about kind of the history of the development of loyalty programs, the Starbucks. You were the chief digital officer at Starbucks, Adam. So talking about um, you know the development of sort of the digital program at, at Starbucks and then all the way through, of course, to like why NFTs are really powerful for loyalty programs. I feel like this is the this is the heart of the case for NFTs, in my opinion. Like people are listening to this. They're going to go home, be with their families at Christmas. Like this is it. We are all building loyalty programs. Like we think of loyalty programs, I feel like, as like Starbucks and coffee. But like if you are a business, if you are a content creator, like you just need to get people's attention and that is their loyalty. So like this is the heart of this is the whole kit and caboodle. So, so excited to dive into it and how you guys are thinking about it. But we do need to hear a word from our amazing sponsors who make this show possible first. When it comes to NFTs, convenience often wins over security, despite scams being everywhere. Brands and artists have no other choice by complying with big marketplace terms and weak security because no good alternative exists. Which is what prompted Ledger to fix the problems of NFTs themselves and launch Ledger Market. The Ledger Market provides an end-to-end -end secure NFT experience for brands, artists, and users, enabling true ownership and control over NFT assets from minting to storing. Ledger Market secures NFT projects via Ledger Enterprise, keeping you protected from phishing attacks and scams. And the market directs users to Ledger Live, where they can transact with a contract directly, giving clear signing details instead of blind signing and praying. Don't trust, verify with clear signing from Ledger Market. Stay up to date on the latest drops and the marketplace updates by following Ledger on Twitter and joining the Ledger Open Discord, which is linked in the show notes below. Bueno is the NFT toolkit you need to launch your digital collectible on the blockchain without coding. Every step of the NFT creation process, from generation to mint, all taken care of by the Bueno NFT Toolkit. With Bueno, you can load up your art layers, reorder the layers, tinker with rarity, everything you need to make your NFT project a reality. Bueno even allows you to mint your tokens on the blockchain with zero code and offers advanced minting logic like linking allow lists, airdropping tokens, and on-chain royalty configuration. As a part of their launchpad, you'll get access to forums to run surveys, email collection, and build your pre-sale list to make sure you are hooked into your own community. Bueno is full of powerful tools you need to build the most expressive NFT project possible. So go to bueno.art and start building your own collections today. Okay, Adam, I want to start with you and go back a little bit to when you were chief digital officer at Starbucks. And can you give us just a sense of what was the kind of macro business context when you were stepping into that role, when you were thinking about building the, the Starbucks app? And really, what was like the mandate for you? And were you getting pushback? Was there hesitancy around it? Or was it a no brainer even at the time? That's a great question uh, because you got to remember, I, I joined Starbucks at the very end of 2008, beginning of 2009. 
you know, there's the Great Recession. Uh, Starbucks was actually, you know, having a tough time uh, mm -hmm. for considering, you know, Starbucks. It was um, Howard Schultz had come back for the second time as CEO. Uh, they were looking for ways to sort of reinvent and transform the company on a number of levels. And I was lucky enough to be brought in at that time and given the mandate by Howard and uh, the leadership team to come up with a great digital strategy that would help drive the company's business forward and help enhance the relationship with the customers. And that was no small, sm no small task, right? So we started, you know, I was, I, there was a great group of people at Starbucks that I was working with and we started to like pay attention to what was happening in Silicon Valley. Like, what, you know, why, one of the questions we were asking ourselves at that time was, you know, why, why can't, why can't Starbucks act like a Silicon Valley tech company in this regard? Why can't it innovate like this? Why can't it think like this? And, you know, that didn't mean we knew exactly what was going to happen. But, you know, the, the iPhone app store had recently opened. Um, we were thinking about ways to create, you know, digital punch cards, if you will. We had a gift card program that had been going on. The only thing we really had was a gift card program. So we started to think about all these things and, you know, study study what was happening in Silicon Valley, study what was happening at, with our customers in our stores. I mean, I, I remember going into the stores and like my first couple months in the job, like learning how to be a barista and watching customers and what were they doing and, you know, looking at that line that was forming and people looking at their phones. And it was just, that's, that was sort of the seedling to thinking about like, well, maybe we can create a platform where we connect the gift card to the loyalty program, connect all that to a mobile app, um, and we, it, right from the beginning, we were thinking about maybe someday we could do mobile ordering and skip the line and um, all of that. But we kind of knew we needed to, you know, build it up sort of brick by brick. And so that was the, that was the backdrop. And it took us years. It was not an overnight success. You know, we, we took years of time. We sort of built it step by step. Um, and as it was catching on, it started to become like a flywheel and, and we got excited about it. And ultimately now it's, um, like you said, it's it's pretty successful. We were, by the way, we Starbucks was the leading mobile uh, payment uh, app for many many years until Apple Apple Pay just surpassed it. So it was like pretty pretty successful, pretty incredible. And the fact that we connected it to all these other things allowed us to, um, you know, hopefully delight the customer. And and in terms of your question on pushback, um, you know, there, yes, there was pockets of pushback from time to time. But, you know, that was part, that's par for the course at a big company. You got to explain yourself. You got to explain the ROI. You got to make sure that you're helping everybody else's sort of team succeed in the building while you're building up this sort of bigger vision. But once it got rolling and the customers loved it and it was driving the business, it became a bit of a freight train that didn't get a lot of pushback, which was good. But it took, it, again, that took years. <clears throat> I feel like boiled down to its, to its essence, it was like, it sounds like you're like, S Starbucks needed more market share, which of course is what every business wants always. And we dive deep on like, how do we make the experience better for the customer, which was probably, I'm sure, is always at the heart of a business's mandate. But I think of like an Amazon as being like, that was their thing. And that was how they became a behemoth. And they made all these decisions that didn't actually necessarily make business sense, like free shipping or whatever, to in order to really create that customer loyalty. Like, does that distillation of it feel right? I mean, it's so simplistic, but. It, that's right. I mean, the, 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 the equation is you're always sort of trading things off. Like as a, as a brand, you're trying to give stuff to your customer and invite them in and give them convenience, give them rewards, give them um, access in exchange. And, and, and you're, you're, you're hoping that the sort of the unwritten uh, agreement is that the, that the brand will, that the customer will love the brand more and that the customer will come more frequently. It's not like a written contract, but it's kind of a quid pro quo. And it's like convenience and rewards and utility and access in exchange for frequency. And, you know, I loved what you said at the beginning of the show about like everybody is in the loyalty business. And it's absolutely true. I mean, you're, it's just all about that, you know, pay attention to what your customers, uh, what, why they love you. Um, and, you know, give them more of it and, and unpack it and find new and creative ways to um, create flywheels with that. Because it's really helpful that, you know, you don't just it's not just like pigeonholing or linear like you just one of the reasons we're so excited about uh, digital collectibles is it breaks that sort of 
linear, I'll give you discounts and convenience in exchange for coupons and discounts. Like that's, that works really well. But one of the things that's so exciting about it is there's so much more about every brand that their customers love. So how can you get into that storytelling? How can you get into what they love about you, pay attention to it and give them more of it? You know, using digital is sort of my favorite way to do it. And then that tends to create these sort of network effects and unlocks. And, and so that's, that's sort of the formula that we use at Starbucks, but I think it's applicable to any, any brand consumer relationship. We may dive into that more later of like, you know, a, a brief step by step how to your advice to, to brands that maybe want to dig into this. Like, is it first like a customer survey? Like, what does that look like? But before we do, I want to bring Joe and Andy into this. How did this uh, this threesome? Is, is it just the three of you or is there a fourth co-founder? There's three of you. OK, I don't it's know just why the three of us. I, I was yeah. confused there. So um, how did the three of you come together to found Forum Three? So. Adam and I have known each other since 2000. We met in Seattle. We're old friends first. Um, I, my background, I'm a web one entrepreneur. I started my first internet company in 1995 just to date me. Um, so I was a, um, a web one entrepreneur, went three for four, switched sides in 07, um, became a venture capitalist in Seattle, seed stage, was um, started a firm, um, uh, called Founders Co-op. And I got involved in Web3 in 2015. While Adam was at Starbucks, I remember telling him in 2017, hey, Adam, you should check out this thing called the blockchain. He ignored me. <laughs> uh, in uh, 2020, I started a Web3 fund of funds, um, which, which is investing in Web3 venture, blockchain native venture funds. And Adam became an LP and investor in that, um, uh, as well as an advisor. That basically journey, uh, which started in January of 2020, we started playing around with NFTs in January 2020 with with um, the launch 21. of Topshot. It uh, was 21, right? 21, sorry, with the launch yeah. of Top Shots, and um, uh, and that ultimately led to basically in June of that year, us meeting Joe and the creation of Forum 3 on sort of a crazy NFT um, uh, project that involved Axi uh, uh, Axios. I'm sorry, um, uh, Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity. I, uh, I always joke that I have like the true D-Gen hero story here because <laughs> I'm getting involved with these guys. So my crypto nft background started in 2017 um my first bitcoin buy ever was uh may of 2017 and i got in actually from a sports betting background and at the time like you couldn't get your bank to let you deposit on sports books so you had to find these crazy ways to do it and so that's how i found coinbase and i ended up at the time uh it was only you know bitcoin litecoin ethereum on coinbase and I dived down the rabbit hole never come out found nfts in 2018 actually uh, just uh through crypto twitter the first ever nft project i saw was something called crypto all-stars which was basically like trading cards of your favorite crypto twitter influencers and it was very um ponzi-esque but it was uh you know the, and and then i started creating content like yourself so i've been doing podcasts in the space since 2018 um and in 2021 i got really deep down this the NFT rabbit hole of, of like play to earn gaming, Axie Infinity, everything like that. And I was kind of just tweeting about it, kind of the old learn in public type of thing. And I got contacted by uh, all of our mutual friend now, Drew Austin, who um, I'm sure you probably know of. He's the co-founder of Knights of DGen and, um, and VC in the space as well. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to an event that they were having. I, I, call it a party adam likes to uh adam likes to push back on that but uh I it was definitely a small a small and a small uh, nft conference that was happening it, it was somebody, definitely a, a small nerd a gathering a of a no, it, gathering. Was, it was yeah. a party Ja rule grilled us dinner it was a party so <laughs> the, uh but so i i went to this thing and and the funny thing is i got invited and i was i have a professional sales and marketing background and so i was working for a medical company and doing i was basically a regional sales director and um i 
got invited to this party. I saw the guest list, and it was a bunch of people at the time I felt like I didn't invite, uh, feel like I was in, you know, entitled to be in the same room as. Just like people like Adam, really uh, successful people. And I realized that for me, it was an opportunity that I had to be there. So I did whatever I could. And I was supposed to be at somewhere in Pittsburgh. And I actually quit my job to go to this party. <laughs> and, and I quit my job the Friday before to go to this party. I, that's where I met Adam. And we talked for like 10 hours that day. And the next thing you know, the following week, I got involved with him and Andy. And we started doing all these kind of play to earn endeavors as this little incubator and as a test ground. And, and we have evolved obviously from there to what, to what you see now. But, uh, that's why I say I have kind of like the D-Gen hero story of, uh, <laughs> that's, what I'm that's like the stuff that makes you believe in fate. You're like, what? you quit right. your job to go to this thing and then your whole life changes. Um, totally. what were some of your, did you have some takeaways? I'm interested to hear that you guys were, you know, doing some play to earn testing stuff. Like what did you learn in that, that test phase? Man, I have it. If I, I always like to answer this one, Adam, and you can jump on top of it. But we, I think what we've taken from that experiment, what we've taken from that experiment to what you see in like something like Odyssey, which we'll get to, is all these kind of really traditional ways that you think of play to earn, where it's customer or user buys into the ecosystem and tries to sustain this ecosystem flywheel where everything, all the value is extractive, right? Everybody's just worried about returning their ROI. And so they're all just pulling out of the ecosystem. And there's no, there's no way that's sustainable when you think about where the value has to come from. And so when you, I think what our biggest takeaway and when you think of how we're going to talk probably about Odyssey is at the heart of Odyssey, it's, it's a game, right? And, but the difference is the value is brought to the user by the brand, right? So there's no necessary way for, or necessary, you know, requirement for somebody to buy into this ecosystem. It's actually the value is being extracted by the user from the brand, being yeah. able to give them these experiences, these rewards, these things, these digital assets for their participation rather than their investment. And I think that was probably for me, the biggest thing we've taken away. And uh, I'd love to hear you build on that, Adam, because we spend hours talking about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was really well put, Joe. Um, you know, when you when you look at you know play to earn, and we were excited about play to earn before we before we sort of realized like, well, when you get into these different games, whether it be Step In or Axie Infinity, or you know, you can get into them. And I'm not saying they're all like this, but a lot of them, they it was they didn't it didn't seem like you know we learned this kind of too late that they they basically didn't set up the tokenomics or programmatics, like Joe said, to be ones where you, you, you needed to authentically, you know, want to, you know, right. play and spend and not just sell. And, um, and, you know, I think that's true. You know, you think about, that's one of the reasons I will say to kind of connect it to where forum three is going and is that, you know, that, that lesson has definitely played into like experiential loyalty and digital collectibles because, um, I love collecting. When I was a kid, I used to collect baseball cards and football cards and basketball cards. And, and now I love, you know, collecting sneakers of all things. And like, basically, like when you think about collecting stamps and coins and art or anything, like, you're not, it's not just an extractive environment. It's like people do it because they love it. And they get value. They have intrinsic emotional value about the thing they're collecting. It's not just about flipping it. Now, it doesn't mean they might not want to sell something that's appreciated or whatever, but that's secondary to the emotional, fun, connective tissue between you and your hobby. And like, that's what's so great about collecting. What's been so hard about brands being able to sort of do anything with this is that they had to manufacture physical goods or give discounts. And those two things are still important, but they're, they're expensive and they're not scalable. The ability to create an actual digital asset that can be coveted for emotional reasons, but also has utility like a coupon or like an access pass or a membership pass, that's an amazing combination. And that's what gets me so excited because I think you can get all those things that we were excited early on around play to earn games, you know, why we got excited about, you know, loyalty in general. Like, I, I think that's why Forum 3 is, you know, you know, trying to set the world on fire when it comes to this topic. 
So I'm going to jump a couple steps in this conversation and then I'll, I might kind of circle back. But you just said something that I think is really interesting. And I feel like it's at the core of this. Why NFTs, why this should be an NFT, why this should be connected to the blockchain potentially. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the, the big kind of bits of feedback you get from skeptics is like, well, why, why do you need the blockchain? You could do this and you could do this without it. Right. And I, I feel like one of the things I just heard there is this element of like digital, collectible, ownable art is this layer that's on top of these programs that right now are just transactional where my my StubHub ticket is a QR code in my email that has no em emotional sentimentality to it in and of itself because it's like this ugly barcode thing. Is that what you were you're getting at there? That's right. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you can tell I like to collect. I think Joe and Andy are the same way. I think a lot of people are. I used to have this shoe box, a Nike shoe box. I can still see it. it like this and it was like you know, I tilted open, it had all these ticket stubs in it because uh, every not everything I ever went to. But if it was a particularly interesting concert or C Seattle Seahawks game or Mariner game or whatever, I would put the ticket stub in there. And so, um, you know, it wasn't about it being worth a lot of money, but it was like right alongside of how I collected baseball cards and stamps and whatever else. So that's right. It's like it's giving it making it an actual asset in your mind for starters. And then in reality, and if you can do that with a, you know, Joe actually had a great tweet where he said, OK, collectibles is an X billion dollars a year market. Uh, think about why everyone collects and sort of the connection to it. And now imagine that it's digital, like hello, like you now you have all the power of digital in terms of like identity. Um, you can program to it. Um, uh, you can it can be self-sovereign. Uh, it can um, it can be an access pass. You can. There's like the analytics and fluidity of trade that can mm. happen as a result of it. All of those things come from being digital. But but at its heart, if it's an ownable, emotionally connective digital asset, wow, that's incredible. And it's and you know I don't when, when people say why blockchain, I'll be honest, I'm not a technician. Like I don't you know a technologist. Like if there's an easier way to own a digital asset, I don't know it. It doesn't mean there's not, but I don't know it. And I understand that Bitcoin is the most decentralized, immutable, secure, it, it is. It's, the, it's mm. the cream of the crop. But I also believe, it, I do believe that like Polygon and other blockchains, like they serve a great purpose to sort of allowing you to be on a spectrum towards decentralization and have that feeling of ownership and have all, all, all those other benefits. So I think it's the, I personally don't know of a better way to do it, an easier way to do it than blockchain. And it allows it to be that digital asset that you can own. And that's what lets it be a collectible and kind of unlock this whole topic. Are there other things when you think about um, what gets unlocked uh, for a brand, building a loyalty program that has this kind of piece of art or this collectible element? Are there other things there? Is it storytelling? Like what else can you weave into a blockchain based loyalty program that feels distinct. And that's to any, anybody who wants to talk about it. I mean, I think it goes a little bit back to the conversation we were just having before uh, that really our roots in act with Axie Infinity and Plato. And when we think about loyalty games, lo when we think about loyalty programs, they're really very simple, very simple shop to earn games. The, the, the trade that a company is making is shop more frequently here, earn points will give you discounts, shop to earn. When we think about what we're doing at Forum 3, it's participate to earn. So it change, it fundamentally changes. What does participation mean? It means whatever the company means. It's storytelling, it's more fun, it's programmatic. There's a whole host of ownership, et cetera, that where the consumer is really at the center um, uh, and interacting with the company and the brand and they're participating and that's where really like it's going to launch it's going to get right into where the the bones of what launched last week um with starbucks odyssey which is just a great foundation for a multi-year builds of immersive storytelling exciting games for the consumer first that also <clears throat> excuse me also brings a loyal engaged customer well, and there's so one other thing Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I know. I know where you're going to go, Joe, and I can't wait to hear. I love. I love this question too because it's, uh, you know, it's what gets me super excited about this, and and it builds on what Andy was saying about just uh, the the kind of shop for discounts game, which really what 
what that is, it's very linear, right? It's the, it's, I shop at your store, I get discount, right? And from a, a business standpoint, one, that's, as Adam said earlier, not scalable. You hit this like diminishing returns at some point on your discount line. And, but two, like, to fix that, right, a brand like Starbucks, who's one of the biggest brands, most recognizable consumer brands in the entire world, has all this insane, intangible brand value and goodwill that they have as a brand. They can go and collaborate with any other brand or artist or musician or creator on the entire planet. And they've never been able to, you know, brands have never been able to tap into that in a way that delivers any value to their customer. Mm. And with a program and with a program like this, you can. And it's actually really clear how you can and exciting, right? Like, I mean, you can imagine a world in which Starbucks collaborates with some of the biggest Web3 artists or up and coming artists in the space. And then and especially with someone like Starbucks who has this rich history of culture and art and music, right? Where it's like you could see them doing so much within that, uh, but it doesn't just apply to Starbucks. It's any brand that has this built up goodwill and, 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 and kind of intangible brand value that they could tap into. So it is, it's storytelling, it's all of that stuff. And then two, I think the other piece is you mentioned kind of before was there's this idea where why blockchain and it's because the NFT kind of becomes this data layer, right? And it's, allows for Starbucks or another brand or another creator to collaborate very easily. When you think about a brand collaboration now from a technical standpoint, it takes a lot. It's a heavy lift. There's APIs, there's tech integrations involved, there's all this other stuff. But as soon as you put these this customer relationship on a public blockchain, uh, the collaboration of brands, of creators, all of these things become super easy. And I think that's a really untapped idea for brands that they haven't even realized is going to be a superpower yet in the future. Exactly. You get to, just to wrap that point, you get with blockchain, it's, e at, le at least in my experience, it's easier to do things like airdrops. I mean, you only usually use that term in this space. At, at least I'd never really heard of it before the space. We used to do something on the Starbucks app. We used to have an inbox and we used to every week have a partnership with Apple where we would drop an iTunes music or app store uh, paid asset into the inbox for free for Starbucks members. It, it, it almost felt like an airdrop, right? And so this idea of doing airdrops on the blockchain, this idea of doing multi-community, multi-brand token-gated collaboration is much easier using blockchain. So besides just the root of like ownership and collectability, this, what Joe and Andy are saying, like the, the blockchain just makes in our opinion, just has this potential to make things so much easier and open up that storytelling and and, and, and get away from that linear aspect of, of, of the loyalty program. I think such a perfect example of what you guys are talking about. I actually heard you say in another interview, Adam, where the interviewer was like, well, wouldn't a brand be worried? Starbucks is worried that that Dunkin' Donuts is going to come in and poach your customer because they can now see all the Starbucks rewards holders and they can airdrop you something and try and vampire attack you. And you were like, are you kidding me? That's amazing. Like, you, like now Dunkin' Donuts is creating more value for Starbucks customers in a very clear way. Right now, they're kind of like insidiously trying to steal away the customers and the customer doesn't realize it's value they're getting because they're a Starbucks fan necessarily. This puts it right out in front of you. And it's like, that's a totally different way of thinking about things. I also think grounding this in this history and not that I'm some like loyalty program or, or marketing history expert, but like, you know, I, I imagine there was a time when there were no loyalty programs, right? There was no shop to earn kind of a program, but things got competitive enough between businesses that some first business stepped up and said, okay, we're going to do a shop to earn thing to get more people coming to my coffee shop than to the co coffee shop next to us. And I think as we only are getting more saturated with options and like the attention economy is so real, we are competing against more things than ever for the attention of the consumer. And this has been my thesis. I've been saying this on the show for you know months now, and it feels almost obvious to say it in this context, but I don't think it's always obvious to people. Like that attention economy backdrop is what is necessitating now, you know, not just shop to earn, but like 
becoming media companies that create experiences for your audience that make them love you. It's why Amazon got into, you know, sells toilet paper, but got into, uh, you know, Amazon Prime and wants to win Oscars at the movies because they want to keep you there watching their movies. Like that's what NFTs is unlocking for every brand to now become, it feels like. Yeah, I agree that there's, um, just to jump in real quick, there, you're right, the, cons- the, the, the consumer, I think it's globally, definitely in the US, like the consumer has changed a lot in the last 10 years. Um, I mean, particularly through the pandemic. But, you know, you think about like Roblox. Um, I, I read a stat that during the pandemic, and I don't think it's changed much, there was like, I think 79% of nine to 12 year olds uh, in the US played Roblox. Uh, and I'm sure that number is even higher if you conclude Roblox and Minecraft during the second quarter of 2020. It's just a staggering percentage. So you've got, you have these Gen Z, you've got millennial, you've got this hyper digitization and you've got an entire, like multiple generations as well as like our gen, I mean, everybody like is becoming more demanding of and appreciative of digital goods. I mean, I think I also read a stat that, uh, you know, there are certain people spend as much or more on digital fashion as re- regular fashion in some uh, for some sectors of the economy because mm. they're buying skins and they're buying things for their game oh, yeah. players. And so you've got um, th- that entire like the consumer is shifting and shifted and we're hyper digitized. We appreciate you mentioned experiences like we it used to be you, know, you appreciated followers and likes and you know, pictures of your food and stuff like that. all this stuff changed what we value. And now you wake up, if you're a brand, you know, you've got to recognize that your customer wants to be more than just a consumer or a customer. They want to, they want to co-create and participate. They want to be part of your story. And that's something that like, you know, that's a big part of what loyalty is, in my opinion, can be. And, and that's what, you know, we're, I mean, you think about Odyssey and you think about what Form 3's thesis is, like, imagine you're a, lo- think about a loyalty program. You've got points because you spent money and then you get discounts. But what if those points could like literally like, in my, and you're going to see how weird I am when I say this. Like, imagine the point like jumps up and can start coming to life. And, and you're like, you'd never would have thought of like, it's just a point. Why would I, what are you talking about? Like, I don't think about owning my points. I don't think about my points doing things other than just getting me discounts. But all of a sudden, if that point became something that you earned and it was a digital asset and it was collectible and it was an access pass and it was part of a, st- a game piece. Like, like, wow. Okay. Like I just, I, like Andy was saying earlier, I participated to get this thing and it could be points and a digital collectible and it gets me access. Like that's an amazing evolution of loyalty in my opinion. The other thing that, that Andy and Joe and I are fascinated by is like studying what's happening with Pokemon Go. I mean, it's Pokemon Go is still a big thing. And you got Roblox, you got Minecraft, you've got Fortnite. Like when you start looking at the the amount of time being spent in gaming um, and that the sort of the co-creation that's involved in all of that, like I I can't imagine if you're an iPad native generation, not only can you not be marketed to in a traditional way, like I don't think they think about the relationship with brands the same way. And I think they do think about relationships with brands. And I think that's an, an important part of how you know, the world is moving. Totally. Well, and relationships, that's why I think you see Mr. Beast chocolate bars popping off and Kim Kardashian starting a private equity firm because it's like relationships with people now, you know, like the big brands are becoming people because it's it's all about the relationship, which, you know, NFTs are so at the heart of this. So when you have conversations with all of the big brands that I imagine you guys probably speak to or CMOs, like what percent get this? Because I'm at the point where this is so damn obvious. And it's surprising to me, people like Scott Galloway, who's a obviously very famous marketing professor and who, you know, I stole the Amazon Prime talking point from, who still doesn't seem to quite get the NFT thing. And I'm like, it's the same thing. It's the stuff you're teaching in slightly different form. Are, are people getting this? What percent of the people you're talking to get this at this point? I, I think it's a small, I mean, the market of that uh, of the last couple of years of consumers that got the NFT got caught up in the NFT craze. Uh, uh, it's a small population, but people are waking up to it. And I would say that certainly with Starbucks leadership and this announcement, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Nike Nike followed suit. Other companies are following suit, and I would say the interest level amongst marketers there's interest. Uh, it's not just casual interest. I think there's interest in 
and concern. And it, it starts, I think, with recognition of what you just talked about, like Mr. Beast and the relationship of influencers and their ability to create pizza companies and chocolate companies, like where that relationship and engagement with the audience leads to enormous opportunity. It's, it's the evolution of the consumer. So I think people are waking up and it's more than a casual interest. It's a thing. Mm -hmm. Starbucks leadership, just as it led with the, the mobile app, there absolutely has been a technological advance that's called the blockchain before it was called the iPhone. Um, and that led to an evolution of the consumer and it led to a, certain companies leading to delight with the consumer. In this mm -hmm. case, in both instances, Starbucks and my good friend Adam Brotman happen to be involved in both of those things. And that's what Form 3 is all about. And, and so it's a, it's a strong early, early wave. Okay, last question before we really get into Starbucks Odyssey specifically, which is, um, can is there a, a quick way to talk about or to kind of summarize how brands as big and sophisticated as a Starbucks measure if they're getting enough value out of their loyalty programs, especially when you start to move into something which is a little bit less direct, like, okay, you've shopped this much, so now you've earned this much and we can kind of do that math. Like, how do you know as a brand that you're actually retaining customers more <laughs> by building a program like this out? It's a great question. I mean, it, loyalty marketers across the globe and all these brands, big and small, they generally are pretty good at understanding their their key metrics or their KPIs. Like so, independent of what their brand is doing and their programmatics and you know what the rewards are and whatever, they're going to be thinking about things like how many active, how many members do I have total? How many members do I have that are active? How many like they're going to try to study spend per member. They're, if they're really good, they're going to try and study incremental spend per member, and then they're going to get into the weeds of like. Oh, I want to get more members spending more. I want to prevent churn. So they've got this sort of dashboard that they are thinking about. Okay. So that doesn't change because of blockchain or Web3 or digital collectibles. And so, you know, that's something to keep in mind is like what we're talking about is just this unlock, this new tool. I mean, it wasn't any different when we launched the Starbucks mobile app and the mobile payment and the mobile loyalty and mobile ordering like they were all we, we we were innovating and we were creating this great program but at the end of the day like the key metrics didn't change like what moves the business didn't change and the relationship with the customer is ever present and you're just trying like i said earlier to tap into that and sort of extract um new surface area between you and the customer that enhances and strengthens that customer relationship in new ways that's what you're trying to do which the customer loves like the customer appreciates that if you're doing that so that you know that doesn't change and you know you got you know joe touched on a really important point earlier if you're getting into like the business of loyalty like you just asked about which is you know loyalty programs are expensive they're di first of all you have to pay for the t you have to pay somebody or a team of people or a company to help you like with the technology behind it, whether it's your own team or some vendor, and you got to pay for the discounts and they're not cheap. And so if you can find ways to reward and engage your customers without it being just about discounts, not only is that more engaging, like we just said, not only is that more, um, more well-rounded and less linear, it's actually pretty good on the bottom line if you can get away with it. Now it's, we, no, it's still too early to say, oh, this is like a tried and true thing, but you know, you think about digital collectibles are kind of like digital merchandise if you do it right. If they're valued by the customer, you're going to sort of create these things. You're going to give them away or sell them or trade them or do something. And like if that's valued by the customer, wow, you just made something that didn't have to be physical, didn't have to be a discount line. And you might not have had to spend as much money on tech because of the open source nature of the blockchain like we were talking about earlier. Those are all things that are going to help the business of loyalty while you're helping the most important thing, which is like open up the emotional experiential side of loyalty. So let's talk about what you guys have in the works for Starbucks Odyssey specifically. I feel like what, what you've said so far is we know there's this game behind it. What can you share about the program? It's open right now in beta to a select number of the waitlist members. Again, whoever wants to, to take that. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've been obsessed with it for the last, you know, <laughs> however many months. But yeah, I think um, at the core of what Starbucks Odyssey is, is, you know, after hearing everything that we've talked about, 
today about how we think of you know loyalty and nfts and blockchain uh at the core of it it's a game right and it's a it's a customer experiential loyalty game um adam describes that you know adam talks about a really like no-brainer example right where starbucks does starbucks for life every december december and it's a massively popular uh activation that they do and they have millions of people that play it every december and then it goes away right and, and so, just to give folks context it's like if you buy as you buy things at starbucks you have the opportunity to win starbucks yeah, like for starbucks life or for starbucks life, for a month uh, or correct yeah. exactly and and so there's millions of people playing that so it, it's a massively popular game and it involves a lot of the same things that we're talking about in uh what we kind of are bringing with odyssey but it's always on right so you kind of take these same concepts and why people enjoy starbucks for life and you're bringing it to this always on um engagement method and it's a game right and so what you'll see actually is you know when you get access to Starbucks Odyssey, you'll come in and you'll kind of create your profile and you'll start to see these journeys pop up. And so uh, the journeys are these, you know, really cool kind of guardrails to create these engagement experiences, right? And so for Starbucks, um, you know, the first ones that you'll see now are their coffee heritage journey and their holiday journey. And so inside of that, there's different challenges, activities, things like that to learn about the brand, to engage with the brand, to, and then, you know, to reward you for the actions that you're taking at the stores as well. And so, when you complete these journeys, you'll earn, or when you complete the checkpoints in the journeys, you'll earn points. And then when you complete the actual journey, you'll be able to claim your NFT, which is a journey stamp. And that will also have points embedded in, into it. And so as you kind of complete these journeys, the whole point is you're completing journeys, you're leveling up your points, and those different levels are going to give you access to different customer experiences, claimable rewards, eligibility for airdrops, like the things that we talked about before with these kind of uh, collaborations and some really unique Starbucks-only stuff. And that's at the core what you'll see with Odyssey uh, right <coughs> now. And then in the future, there's a, a ton of really cool stuff you can do with this concept of owning your loyalty and your lifetime score that you might have and and things like that the the starbucks stamps will be able to be um you know there will be a, a native starbucks marketplace uh that will launch when the stamps are claimable and then uh, you know we we found or we thought that it was super important when you're talking about potentially onboarding millions of people to a platform like this that there needed to be a custodial aspect to it. So there will be a custodial aspect through our partners at Nifty Gateway Gemini, but you'll also be able to pull your stamps off uh, just through your normal wallet connect, like if you're if you're super Web3 native, and buy, sell, trade them on your open marketplaces like OpenSea, et cetera. So um, that's kind of the, the first view of what you'll see when you come into Odyssey. Adam, do you want to add to that at all? No, I was just going to just going to only say um, it's worth giving a shout out to the Starbucks, not only the whole cross functional team, but the rewards team. I mean, we're we're just little forum three. We're a partner to Starbucks. It's really Starbucks that's doing this. And they I got to give kudos to them. Like they really like, you know, we did everything we could to sort of tell them what we know and and become part of the extended part of their team. Um, but you know, they've got, they've got a good team. They've got, they've got a lot they've, they've been thinking about when it comes to rewards anyways. And I just want to give them a shout out. And then of course the partners, Nifty Gateway that you mentioned, um, Polygon is the blockchain that, um, that these are on. And you know, why that's important is like one, one of the things I just want to add, uh, to give some color to what Joe said is it's, it was an important part of the strategy here. Uh, by the by everybody that we you know the average person and you know I think most people listening to this podcast probably you know it's called overpriced jpegs right like it's like they kind of know how to use it. they they understand like we do like the fun and beauty and importance frankly of self custody right they understand yeah. that and they're not like we all had to go through our onboarding of like getting a metamask wallet or whatever wallet and like figuring out how to get like and if they didn't understand it before post ftx they understand it now yeah yeah it's like it's just it's really and, and so we get that and you know we're 
you know, we get these things, but we also believe that like, if you ask the, not even just the average person, if you ask the vast, vast majority of regular people, everyday people, like they don't understand what a crypto wallet is. They don't understand how you would use it. And you're just going to lose them in Mm -hmm. the process. So one of the things we like and admire about Nifty Gateway is that even going into this project, we're like, they were like an OG player in the space they're authentic and they and their founders right they they came at it from the perspective of like let's give people a choice they they don't want to learn about on day one how to use a a a, a wallet uh, for self-custody and you know figure out how to use cryptocurrency like give them a choice for a custodial hosted experience with fiat um, and credit cards and whatnot create a marketplace that's hosted but let, allow for external law connect and give a bridge and so we love that and you know that was a that's a big part of why they're a part of the the experience. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses that need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage its treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the highly secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive single-chain treasury management to expressive, flexible, and multi-chain treasury features, such as global user management, global contacts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Masari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. You have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. We're all bullish on NFTs, but gaining exposure to NFTs as a whole is difficult. How are you supposed to gain broad, generic exposure to an industry that's designed to be unique and non-fungible? Cryptex has the answer. Cryptex Finance produces synthetic tokens that lets you get exposure to areas of crypto that you otherwise couldn't. Their first product, TCAP, provides broad exposure to the total crypto market cap of all crypto assets. And their second product, JPEGs, gives you the ability to get exposure to the entire NFT market. It's the first real NFT index token, so you don't have to go hunting for rares or finding under the radar opportunities. You just need to own some JPEGs because JPEGs tracks all NFT collections with real time exposure. This is a first of a kind product from Cryptex, who has worked in close collaboration with Chainlink for months to ensure accurate price feeds for true exposure. Live minting and trading of JPEGs will open at the end of Q4. So make sure you stay up to date with Cryptex Finance by joining their Discord, Telegram, or following them on Twitter. Yeah, I, I've said uh, multiple times on this show that at this point, like, I, I see certain things as litmus tests for how seriously a brand is taking their entrance in the space. And it, it is how much are they thinking about making this an accessible experience for their existing customers and not just players that are already in Web3. And I think the the onboarding experience is one of those. And then the other big one is, are you using the term NFT? And I love that you guys are not. And you're calling them journey stamps. I think there's a lot of baggage around kind of the NFT term <laughs> in general. And, and I think a lot of brands you can kind of tell if they're using a lot of Web3 heavy language that it feels like, oh, they're really just trying to get money out of the existing Web3 players. They're not trying to really speak to their their existing customer base. Um, I think it's funny with the, the term NFT, like I think that we probably won't be using that term much at all in the next mm. like five years. It's It's interesting, like we talked earlier about like why blockchain, why NFTs. And to us, we talk about NFTs almost like a data layer, right? And so I stole this example from Will from Cryptoids, but he talks oh, about, he, yeah, he talks about how, you know, you don't call your, you don't go say, oh, I'm going to go my, to my Spotify and listen to some MP3s, right? Like you don't do that. You're, and that's how people are going to talk about NFTs in the future. They're not going to, they're not going to refer to them as that. It's going to be whatever the actual thing is. It's going to be my ticket. It's going to be my stamp. It's going right. to be my, uh, you know, my receipt. It's, it's all of those things. And I think just the education piece uh, is a huge part of that too. And, you know, Adam and I and Andy always talk about like this idea of, a lot of us in the space right now came through this NBA Top Shot experience, was, which was very similar, right? It was super easy to onboard. And then the people that wanted to get more involved and understand self-sovereignty and uh, get involved in real kind of decentralization and ownership graduated into these other places like Ethereum or uh, any other like true blockchain Web3 experience that they've had. So we wanted to be able to kind of provide both as well.
Mm -hmm. Two questions quickly. One is, uh, can you give any specifics about what some of the rewards might be? I thought I read in the initial press release, like go to Guatemala and tour a <laughs> coffee plant. And I'm now like second guessing myself if that was actually from you guys or if that was like speculation by others. Is there any specifics you can give on that? They did. I'm looking at the, the Starbucks, their own words they used. Um, and I think they did tease out okay. some of those <laughs> rewards that you just mentioned okay. in terms of like, well, how will you get those or when will you get those and how much, you know, some of what, what will be the mechanics? They haven't spelled that out yet. Although stay tuned, that's coming in the next few weeks that you're going to start to see more of those details emerge. Second question is you obviously give a lot of credit to the Starbucks team. And that's something I want to understand a little bit better. Like, you know, this right now is sort of auxiliary to their existing loyalty program. This is not in the main app itself. It's a web app that's a little bit separate. What is the long-term vision here? You're in beta test right now. What are you hoping to see in this beta stage? What is Starbucks hoping to see in this beta stage to maybe take it to the next level and, and have this all incorporated in, as just sort of one primary loyalty program? Yeah, I definitely want to let Starbucks speak to that more than us, but I, but I'll, let, let me, let me try to my best to answer it, which is that, um, uh, the, the, the broader working team, what was important was that we got something out as fast as we could without rushing it. And also we could learn and we could be like, cause this is authentically like a, you know, a part of the loyalty program. And like, the, you know, Starbucks doesn't, you know, they take that very seriously. So they both wanted to sort of get something out the door that they could start learning and engaging with their customers and not just, you know, wait for, you know, per perfection. But at the same time, they, you know, there's, that's why there's a beta, a smaller group that's in the beta so they can test and learn. And um, uh, the idea of like, you know, putting something in the mobile app, uh, their main mobile app, you know, that would take either more time or potentially more, more extensive. Um, and so, you know, trust me, Starbucks, knows better than anybody the value of a native mobile experience. And so, you know, it's a discussion that's underway, but, you know, by doing this with like a responsive web site that you, that, you know, really easy to use on your mobile phone, um, easy to log in with your Starbucks credentials. Uh, it's a great way to just kind of get going. And I think, by the way, I, I just want to say this, which is that for those that are in the beta group and for those that are going to get let in off the waiting list as we go through January and February, like you're, you know, uh, without, without, you know, being too excitable about it. Like th this is like just the beginning. Like there's a lot of layers that have been thought through here. And, um, you know, we're, just like we did with the, 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 the experience at, at Starbucks with the mobile app and the loyalty and the payment, you know, you sort of build this stuff up and you create your flywheel and, you know, just stay tuned. There's a lot more coming in the coming weeks and months here. What does it take to get off the wait list into the beta? Who do I need to uh, talk to? Yeah, so the, the again, um, Starbucks, so the beta is going to be over fairly soon. I mean, they're actually going to just start going through this process of letting more and more people off the list. The The process of Starbucks, who gets on, you know, it's a, it, they're trying to be as fair as they can, and they're go, going through a process of, um, you know, looking at their like heavy Starbucks rewards users, et cetera. And they've got some formula that they're using. Loyalty program say, is baked into yeah, how to get I, into I, the loyalty program. That's smart. That's yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, and again, one of the things I'd say stay tuned for more details on is more community features. And as those community features go live, there is an opportunity for people to raise their hand and say, hey, I want to be a part of that community. And that may be a way to kind of skip the line, so to speak. But there's in general, they, again, Starbucks, as you can imagine, they really want to reward like i'm pretty sure all of their um their starbucks employees or their partners in the u.s got on um they they prioritized their partners they prioritized like their heavy starbucks rewards users um and from there they're just going to try and work their way through the list based on some formula is as fair as possible we're running close to time do i have you for uh, a few more minutes i have a, a few final questions i want to make sure we get to here um so you you mentioned Starbucks leadership. I think, Andy, you were saying Starbucks leadership really le leading the way on this. I think everyone in Web3 is so excited about this. I know I mentioned Starbucks and Nike and, and a little bit Instagram and Reddit basically every time at this point that I talk about what I think the future is and why I'm bullish on this space. Uh, 
sort of a, a question that's probably hard for you to answer. You have to to, to say no. But like, are we overhyping it? Are, do you, are you feeling more brands coming to you guys now since you started doing this? Or or is that the anticipation? Is McDonald's going to come next and say, oh my gosh, we see what Starbucks is doing. We have to get into this or more fast casual. Like, are we right to be like so excited? Like this is such an unlock? No, I mean, I think you might be under, we all might be under hyping it. Um, I wow. think it's a major breakthrough in loyalty. I mean, we... We're betting our careers. Like Adam and I have been uh, in the tech industry for a long time, and we think this is uh, this is worth our time. So uh, we're betting our careers that experiential loyalty, uh, the unlock of digital collectibles, and really the you know on some level the partnership with Starbucks, working with them, uh, is going to pave the way for brands of all shapes and sizes to go, oh my goodness, like, yeah, like loyalty programs, super important, like shop to earn, but holy cow, look at this. We can do this. We can do this. We can get a participate to earn game going. Like, and it's going to be led, I think, by innovative brands. And then the the consumer, which coming out of the post pandemic, sort of heading into recession, it just makes all the sense in the world that like, oh, like, let's delight the customers that we have. And Clip that. Uh, Social. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. And so, like, that's, I think, uh, I think we might be underhyping it. That said, we're super early. So, like, in the same way with Don't Starbucks, clip that part. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, just clip we, the we hype part. <laughs> we're super early in the sense that we're, like, there's so much to figure out, right? So, I yeah, think, like, um, we're going we're gonna, to, we're on that journey. You talk about businesses of all sizes. You talked earlier, Adam, about how expensive this can be. What, what, what would you recommend for a maybe a smaller or mid-sized business looking to integrate NFTs, maybe build a loyalty program? My parents are small business owners. Do you have a, a quick like step-by-step here or maybe the steps you would take to start thinking about this? On the Web3 side or just in general? I guess either. I, I think maybe a loyalty program in general, but but in the context yeah. of Web3 is the future of loyalty programs. So maybe jump a couple steps and start there. Why not? Sure. Sure. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, Form 3, we just raised uh, our seed round and we're building a platform um, to augment our our services business, which we have right now. And And to Andy's point, we're getting a lot of inbound and a lot of interest from a lot of brands that are watching what Nike's doing and what Starbucks is doing. And like you said, you know, Instagram, Reddit, like there's, you know, I think marketers are, are really intrigued with what's happening. And um, I would say if I was giving advice to somebody in, you know, small or medium size, or, you know, thinking about doing a loyalty program, the first thing I would suggest is it, it wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, jump into Web3. I mean, Andy and Joe are going to kick me under the table for saying that. But it, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. I'd say, first of all, like, really think about what you're trying to accomplish with your customer relationship. Like, have a customer strategy. You know, one of the things I say, if I'm on a, you know, a board or I'm just giving advice to a friend that's in that position, I'm like, you, it's not about a loyalty strategy or a marketing strategy or a digital strategy. It's about a customer strategy. Like, Mm. understand that. And then think about, like, well, what are all the different things that you can do to strengthen and enhance that relationship you have with your customer? I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. You have a lot of storytelling you can do. You have a lot of access you can give. It's not just about discounts. It's not just about tech. Now, that being said, digital to me is always magic. So if there are digital tools that you can use that can give, that can essentially you know, get your data on your favorite customers and be able to program to them and surprise and delight them and reward them. Great. It does so happen that Web3, obviously, we believe, presents an opportunity for for brands to be able to dip their toe in the water in Web3 and in a new way and be able to do an activation. And the cool thing about, like we said earlier, one of the things that we're so excited about with digital collectibles is that if you're a brand and you want to just do a single activation, like, look, let me just create a brand access pass of a sort, um, whether it's collectible or not. I'm going to figure out who's going to get it. I'm going to figure out, like, how many. I'm gonna, I, I get Because of the blockchain, I get to create some kind of artificial scarcity. I'm going to, and then I can basically program that. I can, it can have as simple utility as, like, some exclusive piece of merch, uh, some access to some early product, some access to some online activity. Like, it's really neat to think about how you don't need to sort of boil the ocean. You can just be like, look, I'm going to 
I'm going to do this one thing. And if it goes well, I'm going to keep going. And if it doesn't, I'm going to have done it in a way that wasn't cash grabby or inauthentic. But, but the cool, you know, you hear this used a lot. Digital collectibles or NFTs are like Lego blocks, right? And so you can build, you know, you basically like create that first activation. And this is something Form 3 can help brands with, is that like we can help you think through what is that first activation strategically? Then we can help you think about like how would you go activate it? And you want to put yourself in a position where if it works for you, you can keep going and building on top of it. And if it doesn't, you didn't do anything that was off brand or bad for your, your customer experience. And that's, that's not, you can't say, you can't just launch a loyalty program in general and then be like, ah, just kidding. Right. So the cool thing about doing experiential loyalty is it's like, it's got like optionality and upside. And if you do it right, you can sort of contain it, but it, it's a building block for you to build on. And we don't have time to get into it here, but it's probably worth mentioning. You, you guys obviously have other clients. We mentioned, I think, before we started recording, you worked with Ben Mesrick, who's been on the podcast. We've talked about what, what he's doing, which is very cool. You work with the Boston Globe. I don't know if there's any other uh, projects you, Forum 3 is working on that you, you want to shout out. We've got a couple of really exciting ones that we're hopefully close to announcing, so stay tuned. I was going to give the abridged version of Adam's answer to small businesses and medium-sized business, which he said it, but he said it over a longer period of time. He says, create a, create a brand access pass, figure out who your super fans are and create something special for them. It's a one, it's simple. And it, and it also is not like overly expensive. That's what small businesses and medium-sized businesses should do. I love it. It's helpful. Uh, to close, <clears throat> I want you to settle a bet that is happening in my household. You can't actually settle it because it's a it's a 10 year bet. But I was in Paris last week for the ledger conference and my fiance was with me. We went to this very nice restaurant and somehow we got on the topic of like, I wish I could get a Poe app or something. I wish when I walked into this restaurant, I tap a little thing at the entrance. And for the whole Paris thing, I was like, I want my whole Paris everywhere we go here. We went to Musée d'Orsay or whatever the heck it is. Like I can tap this thing and get my little digital collectible that shows I've been here and I have like, you know, a digital, uh, whatever it would be, storybook of, of my trip. And he was like, and I, it shocked me, but he was like, what? No, like no, nobody would want that. That's what Foursquare tried to do. They failed. You can just take a picture. And I was like, it doesn't feel the same if it's a picture. I don't want to have to like stage a picture everywhere I go. And then I have 10,000 pictures from each different location. It doesn't feel as cool. as like this contained thing where I have these po-ups from every single spot. His big pushback was like, Foursquare already tried this where you could check into locations and nobody cared. I was like, that's totally different, but I can't explain to you entirely why psychologically it feels totally different. Where do you guys land on this? And do you guys have a good argument for me back to, to my fiance for why he's wrong and in 10 years we will be getting PO apps from different places? Or do you disagree? Man, I think uh, this is something that we talk about all the time. And Adam even kind of referenced it earlier with this the way we are like thinking about things sometimes is this Pokemon Go meets Foursquare meets all of these other things. And it goes back though to the core question you asked at the beginning of the show about why blockchain and why that's important, right? And it's because what Foursquare couldn't give you is what you just said you wanted. You said you wanted to own something that showed that you've been there. And you couldn't do that on a Foursquare platform that's owned and uh, that you just couldn't do it. So if you now could take that same concept and you actually are just the, – the only thing you're changing is that feeling of ownership and then that ability for kind of anybody to come and program and play with that – that's the difference. And I it's think also that's also a pretty picture. It's like a it's, smooth yeah. interface showing me cute little pictures that represent each spot in, in sort of like this wallet that doesn't feel like a closed ecosystem. It feels totally different, but he doesn't, it doesn't click for him. He's like, no, I don't so get it. No, there's no question that the selfie and selfie pictures, like they're here to stay, right? Sure. And that at the same time, businesses have woken up. And, you know, if you go back, like, I'll date myself. You used to go into restaurants in, in Paris and you would get a matchbook and people mm. collected, people collected those matchbooks. Mm. And it was like a little memento of, Oh, I ate there. And wasn't that a lovely meal? That was a spec. And that's like, yeah, you can look at a photo, but you've, how many photos do you have of you and your husband? You only have one matchbook like totally. that. And, and so I think you need both. I don't think I actually, unfortunately I won't settle the bet because you're both right. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but me, it's, a, it's a, the bet is that this will happen because to me, like, of course, you're still going to take pictures, but the pressure of like to share it, I have to get the perfect photo. I just don't do it. I don't want to deal with what, that. What, what, this there's no pressure on me. What's important also is is that I actually think Foursquare they were on to something, mm-hmm. but I actually think that they were they sort of missed it. That the the value prop of the consumer for Foursquare was, I'm the mayor of this place. I come the most frequent. Like that was the consumer value prop that they were selling. As opposed to, oh, I I went there and got and participated and got this memento, this digital collectible. And I think that distinction is actually very important to actually it taking hold. Yeah, it, 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 I'll just add, it, it gets to the, the core of our thesis around digital collectibles and the emotional connection about, it doesn't even matter about like the legal, technical, it's how you as a consumer feel about do you feel like you have a souvenir or a collectible? Yeah. That's what's valuable, right? So you, Carly, that's what you're saying. It's like you're, you want, it's not enough to have, you, you want to have a souvenir. And, you know, yeah. like you, it, it, having a souvenir is like having a collectible. And it, you already know what it feels like to own a digital collectible. So you're like, why can't I have a digital souvenir from this? To, and that's better to me than just a digital picture or badge, which is what Foursquare did. And this takes it to that next level. Yeah, and I want that uniformity. And I, I want, like, when, I, when my parents are like, what did you do in Paris? It's like, instead of pulling up the itinerary on my Word doc to remind myself, I want to pull up my wallet and be like, that's right, we stopped here, we stopped there, we went you to this museum, we went to this hot chocolate spot. Exactly, it's a scrapbook. and But I don't scrapbook, and I the picture-taking right. thing just adds pressure to my life that I don't want, and so I don't do it. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate you coming on. I would absolutely love to have you guys back. I think, again, what you guys are doing hits at the core of everything that is why NFTs matter and will be huge. And I'm just so grateful for you for what you're doing and for coming on and sharing all of your wisdom with folks here today. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out. It helps the show out. And it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.